Winnipeg is the largest urban Aboriginal centre in Canada. I grew up here with my tribe, the Jews, surrounded by the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Lithuanians, the Estonians, but no native people. Not in my schools, not in my stores, not in my restaurants. They, I was told, lived on Main Street or on the edge of my city in reserves, or they were historical figures in our textbooks. In a city that is two hours away from the geographical center of North America, our first peoples were always on the periphery of the screen when I was growing up. I am the child of a residential school survivor. I share Leslie's history insofar as I am that unseen Indian. Leslie and I share the legacy of Holocausts. This, no doubt, has helped to shape who we are. But our survival is not the end, but the beginning of who we are today. My history begins with a retreating glacier that carves two rivers into the land. And it is here, at the edge of the floodplain, where the Red and the Assiniboine rivers meet, that we have built a theater, a cultural palace for children, a place of dragons and masks, hobbits and dinosaurs, and gorgeous towers, as Will Shakespeare would say. And here is where two cultures meet, Anishinaabe and all the rest of us. My father's people come from where the Fraser and the Thompson meet in British Columbia. And although I am over 2,000 kilometers from home and territory, I feel a belonging to this place where the red joins hearts with the Assiniboine. As there is to history and lineage, there is a geography to our dreamscapes. I hold in my hand a pottery shard that is an archaeological reminder of a story that has been told here where the two rivers meet for 60 generations. For 60 generations, one family has been returning here to pass on a name to their descendants. Me and the 500 Aboriginal art students are the 61st generation to tell this story. We are both the 61st generation to tell an old story and the first generation to tell a new one. In this place, at the theater, there is a painting of our country that bears witness to the beginnings of this new story. It was painted on our rehearsal hall floor during the first national hearing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The red dots are Canada's former residential schools. We usually repaint the rehearsal hall floor two or three times a year, but not this time. Like flower petals in valley, we have left it to be looked at, meditated upon, trod upon, and absorbed into daily life. Columba and I meet in art like the two rivers at the forks. We meet to share an empty space so that, as equals, we may invent a new one. When we declutter our minds and hearts of external impositions, we invite others into our dreams, into our possible freedoms. Inside this cleared out vessel we call the theater, we invite others to become an extension of ourselves. Outside the theater, I feel like a real Indian and a virtual human. In order to reverse this colonized core belief, I must be safe to dream something different with those outside my experience. In Columbus' production of The Moving Gallery, we celebrated reconciliation, not between peoples and governments, but between hearts. On stage were 17 people between the ages of 15 and 40. We were of the Tsleil-Waututh, Nukhalmu, Cree, Irish, Scottish, Métis, Icelandic, Jewish, and German nations, respectively. We spoke of our very intimate and universal feelings of displacement. We spoke of our need to be free from the isolation that oppression causes. And 
on stage through the spoken word and the creation of live art inspired from these words, we all moved from displacement through hope to reconciliation. I want to tell you about a different kind of reconciliation that we struggle with at the theater every day. It is about Jason, not the mythical hero, but a boy who came to our theater last year and during a production began to walk up and down beside the playing space, moving his arm back and forth like this, back and forth. At the end of the show, when we asked him why, he said he was looking for the edge of the screen. He had no concept of live theater. He thought our screen was so high tech that he couldn't see the edge, so he was feeling for it. I'm not a brain scientist, but I am a keen observer of the young people in our theater laboratory. Jason's explanation is not altogether uncommon. Young people, well, all of us sitting in this room, are now so accustomed to lock our vision straight ahead into a computer or straight down into a PSP or iPhone that we are frequently not able to absorb anything that's actually occurring outside of those borders, that very narrow visual and oral slice directly in front of us. More and more at the theater, we find ourselves reconfiguring the stage so that the action happens beside or around the audience. We deliberately redirect their attention in order to wake up the kids' perceptions and aesthetic sensibilities. The dissonance of looking around to figure things out uh, creates a vitality that is as palpable as if we'd pump their red blood cells right into their circulatory systems. We discovered that physical changes that reorient their attention also attune them to richer emotional nuances. In the center of the screen is a text from my niece. She is 13, and typically she is never parted from her communication devices. She has developed tremendous stealth and skill, so she can stay in touch with her 200 friends on Facebook whether she is sleeping, eating, or waking. My niece can tell me what someone is watching on television in Italy, or who is ballroom dancing in Buffalo, New York. But will she, or can she, tell me stories that reflect her actual experience? Will she find her own authentic voice, or will her voice be one that is manufactured by the manufacturers of iPhone. I sometimes feel, as an adult, that I'm standing on the sidelines, consigning her to the noise, to what some people are calling the discount culture. Does real, actual participation promote vitality? Do data sphere exchanges require only superficial instantaneous responses? These are my questions, but this is her life. By the way, that translates as, LOL, if you take me for chicken fingers, I would be really happy. <laughs> and unlike the immediacy of the virtual tools the net provides to us, or the immediacy of placation that we can summon through television, PSPs, or smartphones, Dreaming takes time. It takes guidance, patience, love, and respect of hope. Dreaming needs room to, to grow, to breathe, and mature. It is only then that our young people can emerge from the virtual cocoon and fly outward into the concrete and tangible experiences that they need to shape the world around us. Although I am tired to the bone of the stats of being Indian, I do die sooner. I do commit suicide more often, and I am one third of this country's prison population, etc., etc., etc. This has been the anchor 
to my own sense of disentitlement. But through the access to expression that art has provided to our young people, they are free to imagine something that I could not. In our play Poorness, we're five filthy rich Aboriginal teenagers. <laughs> and they were richer than God. At first I found this implausible. We all found it implausible to imagine five rich Aboriginal kids. Five rich Indians. Imagine that. These kids feel entitled to be free in their creativity where I could not. Children are the clue and ultimately the glue in Jeremy Rifkin's empathic civilization. In a world where the gulf between I and them could be bridged by what we do today, we want to keep this thought clearly in the forefront of our minds as we work long hours to house and feed and give them everything they deserve and more. This is our prayer. And to the ever-increasing list of things that we provide to children, we want to give them empty spaces. It is in these places where the human element of culture, community, and technology can emerge as prominently as the virtual. We want to leave you with a story. Ilya is the child of Dimitri and Irena. He is seven years old and he is putting on his makeup backstage in preparation for a production. He is possibly the youngest clown in the world. When asked what he wanted to be when he grew up, he said without hesitation, I want to be a clown like my papa. Not a virtual clown, <laughs> but a real clown. Ladies and gentlemen, there is hope at the edge of the screen. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you.